everybody, Mitzi De La Cruz, take three. <laughs> We're having a little bit of technical difficulties today on Lincoln Live, so thank you so much for bearing with us. Today we are here with Spencer Hughes. He's got an amazing podcast. It's uh, Spencer's Podcast and Adventures, and it's pretty cool. Anything goes. You can really talk about everything. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that and about Spencer and, and just see what makes him and his family such a, an amazing uh, contribution to the Lincoln community. So Spencer, can you please start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? You bet. Thanks for having me, by the way. I'm yeah. excited to do this. Um, I was born and raised in San Francisco. I uh, spent the first 24 years of my life there and quite an experience growing up uh, in the 70s and 80s. Totally different city today, but it was fun growing up there. And when I was about 11 years old, I fell in love with talk radio because my parents always had it on. And I didn't even know what talk radio was, but it was... I kept waiting for the DJ to play the music, and there was never any music. It was just him talking and talking and talking and talking. And I was always the quiet kid in the room, only child also, you know, except for my imaginary friends. Um, so I grabbed onto that, like, wow, this is pretty cool. It was almost like a superhero to me, these guys with the golden pipes, you know, coming across the radio. And I told my parents when I was 11, I think I want to do this for a living. And what I loved that my parents did was they never discouraged me from stuff, you know, even though it might have been totally outrageous to think at age 11 you want to be on the radio, but it wasn't any crazier than my friends that wanted to be astronauts or, you know, sure. they wanted to be G.I. Joe or, you know, at that age, kids are like thinking all sorts of stuff that they're going to be. So I determined I wanted to do that and just kept the dream alive and ended up getting an internship while I was at Berkeley um, at then one of the top radio stations in the country. Uh, Sadly, it's it's no longer the top, but uh, I got to meet and greet and even work with and produce shows for these people that I grew up listening to, and that was really cool. So, and have a big family. I, I started off with a boy and a girl, went through a gnarly divorce, and remarried, found happiness, and three wonderful stepsons. So that made five. And five kids wasn't enough, so my <laughs> wife and I had one more, <laughs> and she's ten, going on thirty-five. She's probably watching this. Um, <laughs> And so now we're kind of this Brady Bunch blended family with all the adventures and chaos that comes with that. And been in Lincoln for almost eight years now. That's great. And, and we love it. I, mean, I, I couldn't raise kids in San Francisco today. Oh, it's, no. It's just, and if anything, this feels like it's getting a little too big for us. We just kind of want them to grow up in that experience of kind of a smaller down home feeling, you know, community. You got to go to Wheatland. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's awesome. It's funny because my husband and I, we have nine between us. So, yeah. Wow. That's big. Yeah. yeah I, I came into the marriage with five. Um, and then he came into the marriage with three. And then we just had one together. So, she's 15 months. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> All at home? Uh, no. Oh, just six okay. at home. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us about your background in broadcasting? You kind of touched on that a little sure, bit. Sure. but. Yeah, I started, the best thing, well, I don't know anymore these days if internships still work out the way they did then, but I was 20 years old and I wanted to get my foot in the door, so I started as an intern at the KGO back then, and it was this big flagship, ABC Disney owned them at the time, mm -hmm. and they were, they were one of the top five stations in the country, so I interned there. Worked about a year for no pay. I don't know if that's allowed anymore. <laughs> but they didn't pay, I was putting in like 40 hours a week for no pay. And, um, but I, I was learning so much and I learned from the yeah. producing end, the editing end. Back then we were still cutting tape with razor blades and um, mm -hmm. doing it, the, you know, this was all before computers and the internet and, and stuff like that. But I got my foot in the door and then about three years into it, an opening came up and I kept begging the program director to take me seriously and he goes, you've never been on the radio, you know, you can't just get behind the mic and think you can conquer San Francisco. Because the belief is in radio, you have to start kind of like a TV or a lot of careers. You have to start in smaller markets. Mm -hmm. and most people cut their teeth, let's say, in Iowa or Idaho, not in San Francisco or Northern California. Sure. But I didn't know all these limitations, so I didn't really believe in them. So I just kind of went into it thinking, why can't I do it? And I was kind of that little mad in his ear over and over again. And then something opened up. The format changed on one of their stations. And he said, you know, how would you like to start in three days with your own show? And I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wow. And that was New Year's Eve, 1994. So wow. That was the first time I ever had my own show. Was that, how, how was so, that? How, what was the feeling? It was so exciting. I, I remember, it was funny, when I prepped for the show, like nowadays I just get on the computer and, you know, yeah. go on a couple of pages and you get every news story in the country um, in one page. But 
I, I remember going out with my parents and I, I was so neurotic, I was buying newspapers, you know? Uh -huh. And kids like today don't even go through newspapers, but I was like buying the New York Times, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, you know, the East Bay papers and and just reading everything, taking a razor blade, cutting out the stories that excited me. And then, I mean, I, I still remember to this day how nervous I was and how exciting I was, excited I was to, to go on for the first time. I have to ask, was there ever any dead air or did you kind no, of... No, no. It's funny because I was always the quiet one in the room yeah. until that microphone was on and then somehow it was like my alter ego came out and it, <laughs> it was the opposite effect that I could never shut up so <laughs> <laughs> I was like that was your popcorn <laughs> <laughs> my friends were like you're gonna talk for three hours what do you have to say for three hours <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a co-host or anybody yeah. else to talk to no I had a lot of calls though and yeah. you know I, I I miss that aspect of it of the interaction with the callers and stuff sure but they made it fun and sometimes you get the really kooky ones and that's awesome. The ones that a lot of shows would screen out, I tell my producer, I want those guys on first. You know, it makes things more interesting. <laughs> so. And speaking of that, uh, to everybody who's watching live, if ever you guys have any questions for the for Spencer or for any other guests um, as we're moving through the interviews, feel free to raise your hand. Andra can see um, your questions on her side of things, so she'll just interrupt and let us know if you have any questions. So just to just to mention that as well. Um, so tell us about Spencer's podcast and adventures and where, where can people find that? Sure. Well, what happened was, um, towards the end of my radio years, uh, consolidation made it to the point where there was just fewer and fewer voices and fewer openings for local people to be on the air. Mm -hmm. You can go from here to New York and just, it's Rush Limbaugh, Mark Levin, Michael Savage, three or four people in the whole country. It's almost like having satellite radio. It's like the same voice. Yeah. So I got distressed from that and the roller coaster of being laid off every six months because of format changes and just kind of weird decisions by programming. So yeah. I thought, I just, I can't do this with my family anymore. I have two kids in college, another one going to college, and I, I can't have this instability in their lives anymore. So yeah. I got a real, you know, nine to five job <laughs> outside of radio, which was kind of this dream fantasy job, you know, um, where it never really felt like I, I was like, I get a paycheck for this? this right. Is cool. So then I, I really went to the drudgery of like putting my nose to the grindstone and, and working hard, obviously, to pay the bills. But the podcast idea came about just a few months ago where a friend said, I think you'd really be great on Patreon. It's a site where uh, creators, and there's artists, podcasters, teachers, all sorts of stuff. Anybody that has something with a built-in kind of audience already can do really well on it. And I said, well, I don't know. You know, how does it work? And he goes, well, you just go on it and people subscribe and you set the price. And... You do different tier prices, which is what I've done, and I've done three full months now, and it hasn't grown as fast as I'd like it to grow, but I've done the calculations where if I have 2,500 subscribers, I told my family I can do it full time, which would be a dream. And when you think about it, the numbers, I mean, one of the advantages of a podcast is that you could never survive with a radio show with 2,500 listeners. You know, right. You need, when I was on Fox Across America for seven years, I had millions of people every month listening. Yeah. So the numbers are way different, but it's amazing with things like a podcast. You don't need the volume that you would, you know, for radio or TV or selling a bestseller or things like that. So, gotcha. So fewer people, and it feels like a kind of a tighter knit family, and it's growing by the day, which is good. So. And do you have a lot of audience interaction? Yes, I do. Um, I use Facebook Live a lot to kind of bring people into it, and yeah. I write people. It, it looks almost like a Facebook interface. Uh -huh. um, and there's free content on there as well for people to try out. I always put stuff up just like samples for people to try out. Yeah. And then people interact with me based on, there's even tiers where I'll call them up once a month and just chat with them. And when I had my first 50 subscribers, I called all of them up and <laughs> spent about 20 minutes on the, it's funny because I kept putting it off. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to call 50 people. Yeah. Like 20 minutes a piece because I want to be generous with them and spend some time with them. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I was like, <laughs> no, not stop talking to them. It's down. fun. You know? yeah. It's fun. And uh, I'm always thinking of new things to do with it too. Just yeah. technology allows us, even right now, with the, well, the thought that we could do this with a cell phone and a tripod. I mean, right. It's really amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and having people watching us too. I know. It feels like there's just three of us here. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I know some of the subject matter, you had kind of sent that to me before this interview so sure. that I could see. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so can you explain the law of attraction in your own words? I know that's one of the things you talk about. Yeah, the law of attraction has a lot of haters and a lot of 
supporters and it sounds kind of, and when I first heard about it years ago uh, it was with The Secret when mm -hmm. it came out and of it course. just exploded and everybody and I thought ah, this is kind of granola chomping craziness to me you know but I got into it and I started applying it and then wow. I realized that they've been talking about this for thousands of years you know right. just didn't, they didn't call it the law of attraction but the earliest philosophers believe that what goes on in our head manifests everything that goes on in the outer world yeah and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, God, that's absolutely true. You know, right. like right now, everything that's happening is is in my own head, and it's in your own head. Right. It's in your own head, and nothing really exists outside of the mind. So we can control really what our thoughts are, mm -hmm. and then one good thought leads to another good thought, and it's just kind of the idea that like attracts like, and you can't really have a bad day when you're thinking really good things all day. Right. And the, the opposite's true too, you know, like you stub your toe in the morning and then kids leave toys on the ground or the dog pooped the kitchen and all this stuff's happening, you're late for work, your car breaks down, flat tire, you know, it just snowballs. Yeah. And it's not a coincidence, I mean, mm -mm. there's days we have where we hit nothing but red lights, right? Yeah. And every time we turn on the radio, our song's over. And then there's songs where we, there's days where we're just gliding through the green lights and yeah. Our favorite songs on every five minutes and kids are behaving and everything's just kind of in tune and I think we create that. Yeah, and I totally agree. I think everything's a vibration and you yeah. know when people are on the kind of the raw and ragged edge, yeah. they wonder why they don't have a good day and right. when they're calmer and just kind of take things easy, things tend to work out. No, I love that because you know, I last night I woke up in the middle of the night, I couldn't go back to sleep and all I did was just think about everything in my life that I'm grateful for. And I just do that, you know, habitually. Right. It's I'm constantly just in a state of being appreciative and thankful no matter what's going on. Yeah. And it, it just life just gets better and better and better and better. Yeah. I mean there are no bad days. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's always, you know, you look at perspective and just what people around the world are going through. And I know it's easy to say that it could always be worse, but Yeah. You know, it really can be. I mean right. there's some people out there really, really going through worse things than we are. That's right. Gratitude's really important. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you bet. Um, so what, what is the biggest takeaway that you'd want your audience to get from you? I think my biggest thing is to think for yourselves, and that's one of the big themes I have, and it's alienated me from a lot of my earlier listeners that remember me from the 90s, because I was a little, well, my wife would say she's probably watching this, <laughs> a, a lot more kind of stringent and strict on things, and this is the way, or there's no way, and I don't know where I got that, but I, I was like that into my 20s and 30s and then my wife and I met and she kind of taught me like well there's you know another way to look at this and it's not all black and white and we're taught you know that this is the way to do things and and I think mom and dad taught us well but there's a lot of things that we're wrong about right and I think we get to that maturity level where we just think intellectually like well just because mom and dad taught me this doesn't mean it's right it doesn't mean because the Republicans told me this was right, it's right, or the Democrats, or the church, or whatever your religion is, or politics, or anything, that just because you're told something's the way to do it, you should always be questioning. So that's kind of my main takeaway, is it basically question everything. Mm. I mean, even things you think you're sure about, maybe ask yourself why you believe them, and right. whether it's not a better way to think about something. So that's how we evolve and grow. I think so, yeah. I mean, some of the thoughts, I mean, um, one topic, just real quick, is like gay marriage. Like I grew up in San Francisco, where I mean that's like the capital of you know, kind of gay and lesbian lifestyle things. It was like a huge ground zero for a lot of that. And my thoughts then were different. Now, now I'm much more accepting, and I was just very strict about it because uh -huh. I'd been taught, you know, not so much by my parents, but just kind of society. And you know, I'm supposed to be a man plus woman, and lots of kids. And then I'm thinking, well, they're not hurting me. I don't. It's not my lifestyle, but if that's how they're born or they choose or whatever the case may be, it's none of my business. And yeah. I think is it the, the old, I'm almost 47. The older I get, the more I just want to have people leave me alone. Yeah. And then I leave them alone and just... Live and let live. Yeah, just kind of, <laughs> you know, that's like our fantasy world. It's like right now we're still kind of like in a planned community, but our goal is to like be on a little farm no neighbors anywhere around and just let me be, you know, <laughs> I won't tell you how to live your life. Don't tell me how to live mine. And just, people just get so into each other's business and it just yeah. makes everybody miserable. I mean, you're not going to change someone and they don't need to change for you. So sure. Yeah. Now I know a great realtor when the time is right. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any final thoughts? 
Anything else you want to share? No, everyone's welcome. It's it's a great podcast. I think, oh, of course, it's a great podcast. I do it right, so I think it's good. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it sucks, but um, I do it every day, seven days a week, even when I'm feeling lousy, and I, I just get in there and I do it. And I do videos, I do audio. Um, there's different tiers, so I have like an adventure tier, like when I go out on back road adventures or exploring, people can access that. But it's really fun, and you can try it for free. And I tell people. Um, you can do it for a buck a month, and I looked up all the things you can get for a buck, and it's like nothing. <laughs> a, a song on iTunes, which you probably don't even want anyone. You've heard it five thousand times. Um, kids scissors, maybe a soda and a soda pop machine. Used Hillary Clinton book. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, or my podcast for thirty days. So I like anyway, that. Yeah. So. So tell us again where we can find you. Sure, it's Patreon, which is p a t r e o n dot com. Slash Spencer S P E N C E R Q S H U G H E S. You know, and I'll actually post um, that information in the comments as well. So it's really easy for you guys to find Spencer. He's been an amazing guest today, totally very entertaining and a lot of great things to say. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun doing this. Yeah, thank you so much again for thank joining you. us. And thank you Thanks guys everybody. for joining us. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Merry Christmas. Merry